Hello, everybody. My name is Katherine Barron. I'm a longtime education reporter and host of The Score, a podcast about academic integrity and cheating. Over six episodes of The Score, we'll be looking at the landscape of cheating in school and delving into the key issues at play in this multifaceted issue challenging academia today. We'll ask the experts and students to provide insights into what's happening in our classrooms. How big a problem is it? Who cheats? Along with what policies, regulations, and changes in teaching and assessment show promise in curbing cheating. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at PodcastTheScore, one word, or stop by our website to download show notes and see our lineup of guests and release dates. We're at PodcastTheScore.com. Again, that's PodcastTheScore.com. On this episode of The Score, we're speaking with Dr. Karen Sims Gallagher, Professor of Education and the Hagen Chair in Women's Leadership in the Rossier School of Education at the University of Southern California, where she also served as Dean for 20 years, and Dr. Mark Biggin, a staff scientist in molecular biology at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He also teaches at UC Berkeley. Welcome to The Score. Let's begin with what happened to put this issue on your radar. Dr. Gallagher, was there a specific incident? There wasn't a specific incident. I mean, I'm a lifelong educator where I believe that education is the best road to a good future for an individual, his, his or her family, and the community. So cheating is not the way to have that education. Uh, secondly, we were an early adopter of online programs at the master's level. And my ears do perk up when I hear how bad online education is because online education is one of those terms that covers a multitude of things. And then third, I'm chair of a national accreditation council, the Council for the Accreditation of Education Programs. And I think that accreditation has a role to play here. So it's those three broad areas that uh, caught my interest about the increase in cheating. Dr. Biggin, in an article in Forbes by Derek Newton, you described yourself as being naive about the amount of cheating in online tests. What happened that revealed this dark side to you? Uh oh, direct experience from a class I was teaching. During the lockdown, suddenly we were giving exams that were unproctored online as opposed to proctored in person. I assumed uh, that if we just told students to follow the honor code, they would do that. And I didn't imagine many students would cheat. But the readers, for the first time I was doing this, pointed out they found two students who obviously had copied their answers. They were very similar. And from there, I, being me, somewhat an analysis person, I started doing a statistical analysis. And I found that some of the students had very similar, unusually similar question scores. So they got the same scores for many questions and so the greatest scores and so when we looked at the written answers of those students we found that many of those had cheated and uh, the students that we challenged most of them confessed and through some iterative process we kept finding more and more students who cheated and we eventually found that in that particular class it was the worst case we had actually 19% uh, of the students in the end we found had cheated and I was you know, floored uh, I I kept saying oh I I found say five or six groups, 15, 17 students said, oh, well, that must be most of them. And then one of the students who cheated said, oh, no, 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 I bet there's more than that. And that student was right and just kept going. So that was my entree. And then since then, as we'll discuss later, I've developed a more rigorous, accurate statistical method to find students with very few false positives and high recall. So we spent the last year doing that now. Dr. Biggin, that statistical method you developed is called QCID, which stands for Question Score Identity Detection, and it detects collusion among students during a test. So how were students sharing information? Well, it's important to say these were online exams which were unproctored. They were actually open books, so students were allowed to look at lecture notes, but that wasn't sufficient for some of the students. What they do is they first go through and answer all the questions that they can answer, and then they collude by just literally sending an email with or in some way of text whatever literally the entire exam that they've written and they copy those answers from their colleagues that they didn't know the answer to and the collusion occurs among the sociology of it is, is these are study groups gone wrong so 
many students do work together and we encourage them to work together on practice problems before the exam in small groups. Groups of people who you trust, who you know, who perhaps are of similar ability to you and uh, they are used to exchanging information but they shouldn't do it during the exam and they just continue that process and it's just wholesale copying. When you look at some of the copied answers, so a chemical structure, they copy it minutely. So it's not that they, they're really just blindly copying. This is not an intellectual collaboration. This is blind copying. And I think that's going to Karen's point earlier. This is why it's so antithetical to the academic ideal. They haven't learned. They're just blindly copying. How does QCIT spot this type of collusion? It simply takes the question score. So for any exam, there are say 20, 40, 50 questions. Each one is graded, one maybe for two points, one maybe three points, and whatever particular score each student got, one may get one out of three, one other may get two out of three for a particular question. This grid of scores for all the questions, it simply takes that information. And it, it, it's surprising to me how well it works. It, uh, the false positive rate for our most stringent group of students we identify most confident, confidently is we'll falsely identify one in 2,000 students as having colluded, but we can find up to uh, four, but particularly we, the median is we find 4% of students on unproctored online exams are cheating. So the signal to noise is quite good from 4% cheating to a false positive rate of 0.05%. And I should say, I do think it's important to say that QCIT should not be used on its own to accuse a student of cheating. You, then, you use it uh, to solve the needle in the haystack problem. It points you to students who are very likely to have cheated, but you then have to go and look in detail at their written answers and determine are those written answers clearly uh, copied as opposed to uh, just two students who happen to have got very similar scores. And so it's, a, it's part of a two-step process, but without the first step, QCID, there's no way to find those pairs who colluded because in a class of 100, there are 4,900 possible pairwise combinations. So a professor can't sit there for hours looking at student A with student B and then student B with student C's exams and looking in detail to see if they're similar. There's just no way you can do that. That's why students have been able to get away with collusion. We solve that by pointing you to the few exams you should look at. So that's how the method works. Dr. Gallagher, does USC have something similar? I'm not aware of that, although for as a university-wide tool, but it wouldn't surprise me if some of Mark's colleagues in our STEM areas might have have something they've either developed or maybe they've even, um, you know, uh, been told about QCIT and they have used it. But most of our university-wide tools for detecting cheating are the traditional, let's run it through to see if it's plagiarized. Perhaps a program like Turnitin, which detects plagiarism? Yeah, Turnitin is, is probably the most widely known. I, I actually, we have no figures on how much it's used. Could I just add that? So our, our method uh, attacks a different problem than plagiarism. So collusion on exams is different from plagiarism. You need different methods. And although there have been methods in the literature for working on specific multiple choice exams, to my surprise, we haven't found anything resembling our very general method. So uh, it, as far as we can tell, it's relatively unique. It's certainly in terms of the literature, published literature or anything. We've, we've talked to a number of companies and other people and we haven't come across anything similar. What happens when a student is suspected of cheating? What's the process at your universities for dealing with this? Well, there's a set procedure at most schools, actually, including UC Berkeley, where there's a center for student conduct, a professional group of people who, are, who have this very professional uh, approach. Once, once a professor really has gathered evidence that compels them to think that the student has cheated, that evidence is then passed on to somebody. In, it, it, Berkeley is called the Center for Student Conduct. Many have similar names or a judiciary or something similar. And they go through a set process. And uh, that part of the system, I think, works well and is well thought out. The bit that's falling down is the professor in the first place being able to find evidence of collusion. Uh, that's the tricky bit, the bit that has the weak links at the moment. Dr. Gallagher, USC has an innovative process. It lets students be the judge. Would you describe how that works? 
Commons. It's called uh, the Student Judicial Affairs and Community Standards, best known as SJAX. And um, when a faculty member uh, has evidence of cheating, and that can be uh, a multitude of, uh, you know, of evidence, they turn it over to SJAX. And there's a form a faculty member fills out and, a, and gives to the student. So the student is aware. And that's the reason it becomes an SJAX, because the student has a, an opportunity to respond. It is really overtaxed. In the last couple of years, we've had over a thousand cases that have been referred to SJAX, not exclusively for cheating, but between uh, the fall of 2019 and the fall of 2020, there was a 115% increase in cheating, reported cheating by faculty. And most of it was what we call contract cheating. It was collusion, looking up answers uh, during a test. Again, a lot of unproctored tests. So it was like many universities, we rapidly went into online education through Zoom and we saw this increase of reported cheating. The rate of cheating is breathtakingly somber, and it seems that as soon as there's a new method to detect cheating, students find a workaround, especially for online exams. But students also have plenty of help from commercial businesses. Dr. Gallagher, you wrote about this in an op-ed for the Los Angeles Times. You focused on the massive industry that's grown around cheating, which we've discussed on other episodes of The Score. You write, what surprised me most as an educator playing this cat and mouse game for decades is that cheating is now scaled and outsourced internationally and powered by venture capitalists, Wall Street investors, and billion dollar companies. Would you tell us what you found about the scale and sophistication of these businesses? We know the, the saying, there's an app for that. Well, when it comes to cheating, there are hundreds of apps for that. And that is because contract cheating, which really is outsourcing answers or essays to, for an exchange of money, uh, is very lucrative. In the last uh, 10 years alone, there have been, many, there have been a, a sizable investment by venture capitalists in apps that clearly are cheating apps. I mean, they say they're for homework help, but you know, they're inexpensive. They're like uh, signing up for Netflix. So it's, it's possible for almost any student to use these apps. Now, you know, be clear, we've had cheating like this. We've actually had what you call contract cheating, but it was usually something that students who had the resources, either the money or the ability to find people have used. But with these apps, and I'm not, I, 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 as an aside, I'm not naming any of them. I don't, you know, I don't think that's the important part on this. It's just that it is very lucrative for these for-profit ed tech companies. And they advertise on social media so that students are inundated, you know, whether on Facebook or Twitter, you know, they, they get advertising for this. And it's, it's in a kind of advertising that appeals to students about how overworked they are, how awful COVID is, let us help you. We can uh, not only help you with your answers to your math problems and your, you know, uh, in the STEM fields, but also we can write that essay for you with as little as a couple of days notice an exchange of money, we can have someone write that five page paper for you all the way up to we can have them write your research paper. So again, it's the number of commercial cheating apps out there and their ability to uh, advertise in places that students will find students. Right, the advertising used to be flyers stuck up around campus, now it's ubiquitous. It is. I'd like to bring in a student voice. I spoke with a student at Santa Clara University. Her name is Carolyn Cumulus, and she conducted a survey of cheating at the university and wrote about it for a journalism class. She doesn't excuse cheating, 
but found a common sentiment among students is that everyone cheats. And if you don't, even if you're an excellent student, you risk getting lower grades than classmates who don't study. Here's a clip from our interview where she describes the atmosphere that breeds this behavior. But I don't think most students are cheating to take the easy way out. I think that they have just been like kind of socialized into this culture and this education system that puts so much weight on grades and numbers that they feel like they need to do like whatever they can to get the highest grade that they can. I think of it as a sign that students are stressed out about the wrong thing. They're stressed out about numbers and grades when they should be concerned about learning outcomes and intellectual growth. What are your reactions to this? Dr. Gallagher, her research seems to fit your observations about reluctant cheaters versus practice cheaters. I'm not surprised by what she found. Uh, in fact, uh, just a week or so ago in Inside Higher Ed, there was a report on cheating of about 2,500 students, and it found that. I mean, uh, first of all, not everybody is cheating. I know it seems that way, but it's still a surprising number on student self-reports show that students are cheating. And surprising because, you know, it is a self-report, but a, a lot of students are aware of that socially that's not the thing to say. So it could be that there is more cheating than we, we believe, but still, it's not everybody. I think the last point that she made about learning outcomes and intellectual growth I think as a professor and as an educator, we'd like to believe that that is why all students go to college, pick majors, you know, are in the, because they want to learn. There are things that they want to do with what they learn. It's about their professional growth. On the other hand, we have a lot of extrinsic rewards that we dangle in front of students. What does it take to get an A? You're going on to graduate school. You know, there's so many things that I think play into people deciding to cheat. But again, not everybody cheats, but we at the university have to do something to help students understand and help those who decide to cheat find another way. Right, because there's a lot of harm wrought by cheating, not just for the students who don't learn and may even suffer some emotional consequences from resorting to cheating. That's for the reluctant cheaters. But there's also harm to universities and society. Dr. Biggin, this is one of your major concerns, especially because some important courses are more prone to student cheating. So we get a median of 4% of students cheating across all the exams we've looked at, uh, but it varies greatly by class. And some classes seem to have a more persistent problem, probably because they're considered by the students to be high value because uh, they're important. One is that I teach is required for medical school, and that's one we've had the biggest problem with. Uh, and so that speaks to, I think, is telling you to some extent why students are doing this. It's, and again, to carry on what Karen started, the economic incentives are enormous and the social status of being an MD and the, the tens of thousands of dollars difference in income per year, depending on your GPA, uh, particularly grades in key classes, is an extreme, you know, this is, all you have to do is not tell the truth in this exam and you might get tens of thousands of dollars more. I mean, you have to do it over multiple classes. That's, I think, I think academics are to some extent a little naive at ignoring that incentive. It's an enormous effect. And as to the harm done, we've already discussed, I think, that if students know that other students are cheating, although only a minority cheat, the rest of the student body are aware this is happening, particularly during the pandemic. But if you have a lot of online courses or those courses where it, people can cheat and do cheat, the other students know. And so if the, if the administration, the faculty aren't making what are perceived to be a sufficiently effective uh, attempts to mitigate and stop that cheating, it creates a pall over the environment, the sort of the sense of trust and comfort with the system is corroded somewhat. I don't want to exaggerate that because most students love their universities, but they perhaps love them a little less on this issue. Okay. And so the other harms are the students who cheat really, from my interactions with a number of them, they really, most of them are, are, are remorseful, not all, but 
the practice ones, the practice cheats are remorseful, but most of them are reluctant and they are remorseful and they'll have to live with that all their lives that they did something like this. And the third harm is to the students who don't cheat. But most classes are graded on a curve. Now we can estimate approximately how much improvement in grade a student gets from cheating and it's about, it's consistent with other estimates, about 10 percentile or one letter grade. So if a student would have got a B without cheating, they may get a B plus if they collude. Well, if, if because most classes are effectively, the students are judged relative to the students, for every student who goes up a grade, an honest student who didn't cheat goes down a grade. So at 10% of students cheating, that's 20% of the grades are inaccurate. 10% got a grade too much, too high and 10% a grade too low. That's, again, when you consider the amount of, uh, let's just think of, again, we don't like to think of finances, but the, the tens of thousands of dollars of tuition and living expenses that students are paying to, to the institution, to expect the product they're buying, we don't like to say that, but it's an extreme, you know, it's more expensive than a car. This is to purchase something and then it not to be accurate and that accuracy can affect your income. That's an extraordinary thing that you know, we, again, we don't like to think of economics, but, uh, but it's there. Um, so there are the three harms to the environment, to the individual student who cheats and to the students who don't cheat. I think we're all struck by fear to learn that some future doctors are cheating. Uh, Dr. Gallagher, I can see that you have some thoughts to add to what Dr. Biggin is describing. Yes, I agree very much with Dr. Biggin that it is, we have to do something as the administrators um, and as faculty. We cannot let uh, students uh, prosper from cheating. In the long run, if we erode the belief in the academic integrity of a, of a, a college, a, a school, a department, we all suffer. And um, that's, that is probably the most insidious part of cheating in general, but these contract cheating, these, these uh, companies, these uh, websites, these applications that are flagrantly, uh, you know, selling cheating kinds of services. And it is up to us. I think we, both administrators, working with faculty and working with students, because the other students, I mean, it's right. Other students don't want the cheating to go on. They know it not only harms them on a grade, but in the end, it can harm the value of the degree that they get. So, uh, you know, I, I'll go back to the, the system that we have at USC, this SJAX. One of the problems is they are completely overwhelmed. It's always been slow, but it is a very slow process. So they might, a student might not get a resolution of this for three months after it's reported or maybe even longer. So that, that hangs over their head. And in the end, it's a punishment. That is what this judicial system is, is a punishment. Now, you know, yes, I believe that some behavior punishment may correct it, but in the long run, I think we need to begin looking at what can we do in terms of instruction, assessment, uh, how we organize the, you know, the a program. Those can also have a positive effect on, um, on students not seeing the need to cheat. We will never totally eliminate cheating, but we can, I think, by looking at why students are cheating. And that's a whole number, another subject here, but why are students cheating? And yes, the external rewards, we get it, but there, there are other reasons that students cheat that perhaps we can address. That's a great segue into my next question. What can we do about this? And before you answer, I'd like to play one more piece of the conversation with Carolyn Cumulus, where she says, everyone seems to be at a loss of how to address this. To provide some context, she attended one of the most competitive schools in the country, where the pressure to excel is so extreme that there's been a rash of student suicides. We talked about it a lot in high school, like teachers were concerned and everybody was kind of like 
we were like swimming in this water, but we also knew that the water was poison, but nobody really knew like where to start in like cleaning it up. There's no simple answer, but where and how do we start? Dr. Biggin, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the physicists are always telling us, if you haven't measured it, you haven't understood it. So the first thing you have to do is measure the amount of cheating, the different forms of cheating that are occurring and know when and where it's occurring. Uh, and uh, so you can use our method system-wide, any administration for free in a, probably a day or two could run through all their exams and measure in which classes there's the most collusion. Uh, and that would be an excellent start. Then you have some idea about how to mitigate that. Oh, let's do more remote proctoring. Or let's compare remote proctoring of this type of remote proctoring to that type of remote proctoring. You then compare the change in the amount of collusion that occurs when you put in your attempt to mitigate. Okay, this is basic, you know, how to affect a system 101. But that kind of scientific, rigorous, professional approach is not being used by and large. There are a few tiny studies published in the literature that look at this, one or two classes at one school. I also know that I've reliably informed some other schools, they also conducted some small data, but they haven't, the administrators haven't allowed it to be published. But I know of no school that has really done a large scale study. And with our tool, anybody could do it. And we've been trying to get administrators at different places to take up this idea and so far none have bitten and I, I don't see a good excuse for not measuring, not just looking and seeing how much of a problem you have. There's no reason not to do that. That's got to be the start and then if you want to, whatever solution you think you have, you've got to see how effective it is. We've been able to reduce cheating by about twofold by informing students in advance of the method and actually showing them the website and the website has a specific page uh, addressed to the students explaining that our goal is not to catch them but to dissuade them and to tell the honest students we're doing this don't feel threatened we're doing this to make sure you get the grade you deserve i assume cheating would plummet it dropped about twofold there was still i still had seven percent of my class this last summer collude even with all that information and telling I mean, the, the website explain to them you'll be caught if you cheat and they cheated and in fact one of those students had been caught in the term before in the class was failed took the class again cheated again and was caught again and i think you have to realize that's happening if you want to think about and in that case i'm pretty sure that there's some i, I don't there are he has issues that are beyond you know that was clearly unwise and I think that's clearly something else going on with that student so I think there are different reasons and I think we're having that kind of level of information is helpful we've also got some preliminary data on how uh, remote proctoring was reducing to a similar extent but not eliminating because the remote proctoring is difficult when you have a large number of students and a few people looking at a video of a partial clip of somebody. So without that kind of data, without taking this as a science problem, uh, we're not going to really get a hold of it. So I'm, I'm sure that that's, that that's that's a key 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 aspect of going going forward. But Dr. Biggin, I wonder about the social and emotional aspect of what Caroline said. Instead of just looking at it from the perspective of how do we discourage students from cheating by essentially using fear of punishment, how do we flip that around to get to the root a little bit? Students say they're far, far more anxious today than they've ever been. There's been a survey by the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA, which has found that students self-describe themselves as significantly more anxious now than they used to be. So isn't that something that we also need to discuss? I, I think I'm probably going to defer that answer to Karen, who's been a dean and therefore is probably more into that area. But I can only say that I agree that they're they're stressed. They're making unwise decisions. You can, when you interact with them, they they sound stressed. It's not as if we didn't first try to just say, you know, be honest, don't cheat. We we tried all that stuff and it wasn't effective. And I, I would say that there is. It's a minority of the minority 
who are what we what Karen and I both call practice cheats, who are just determined. And so for th there will always be some students who are not persuadable. Given a chance, there's a small minority that will just go ahead. But for the rest, yes, we can work at trying approaches. But even if you find some strategy, whatever that strategy is, you want to measure that it's actually working. So our method is both a way of catching students and using fear, but you can also just neutrally look. You could just look at what's happening and not accuse any students, but you can still measure it. So whichever those strategies, you know, you, you have a choice of strategy, but a strategy where you close your eyes and hope is never going to work. So you've got to open your eyes, you've got to look and you've got to measure carefully. Message one. Message what you do after that is debatable and difficult and this is one thing that slowed this whole thing down is there's a lot of uh, fixed attitudes among different faculty which are all different we all have different opinions we love to debate and argue which slows things down and there's a lot of emotion here this is not a pleasant subject it's not nice to think about your students in your class cheating and this these things have got in the way it's one reason why this problem is hanging around of course, it's got worse more recently with more and more online approaches, but also we're being slow fixing it as a as a team, as academia, because of all these other extraneous issues. So we have emotion on our side as well as the students, and both of these things are getting in the way. Dr. Gallagher, is it possible to reach the reluctant cheater by addressing some of these root causes that are stressing students? Yes, I believe it is. I mean, honestly, I believe everyone can learn. So given that, um, I believe what we need to do is design it. It's an instructional issue. It's an assessment issue. It's us, um, again, going back to what motivates students. Are they, you know, did they come to undergraduate school because they want to go on to become a lawyer, a doctor, or get a PhD? Um, what is motivating students? And, and that is some way that you can address if they're tempted to cheat or if they do cheat. But I, I really wanna pick up on this notion of measuring it. I found out about the 115% increase in SJAX at USC through a student publication. We do not publish what's going on at things like at USC and our, our, our uh, handling of student disciplinary actions, nor do most universities, in fact, I went through several student newspapers to find that there's been this increase since the pandemic forced, you know, most undergraduate or most uh, classes to be online. Well, if you don't know what's going on, you know, you're, you're both unaware, but also there's not much we can do about it until we recognize it is an issue and measuring it. That is seeing, again, reported issues. A lot of cheating does not get reported because faculty members say, I'm the bad person if this happens. You know, students will like give me bad reviews on my end of the semester. Um, it it re destroys the, the teacher student relationship. Um, so we're only looking at reported, but if we even knew like the 115% increase, if we knew what courses, what disciplines, what kind of cheating, we could begin to address it. We are just shooting in the dark here in terms of institutionally, as well as you know across higher ed. Is there a possibility that some professors don't even wanna look at it because of what you said? I mean, it could raise issues that are pretty embarrassing not just for them, but for the university. You know, it's never a good thing when a school like the U.S. Naval Academy suddenly has this huge cheating scandal that's front page news. So what's in it for the university to really go after this? Well, I'll go back to that. Uh, the basis of uh, a university is this belief in academic integrity. And it, 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 it's a two-way street. It is not only just students' academic integrity, but the institution. So yeah, it's embarrassing. But by getting it out, making it public, trying to understand. I mean, I, I never saw anything past the, uh, the formal reports of the number of students who cheated at the Naval Academy. But why? What, what was it? Was it all? In, I mean, I, I don't know. So once we understand, you got to know. You have to, have, you have to measure it. You have to know. 
And then you can begin to do something about it. And again, it goes to this notion of the uh, integrity of your degree, of your institution. And in the long run, being candid about what's going on because students know, and quite frankly, parents know, and the media find out in another way, and that doesn't make you look good. So it's in our own self-interest as well as in the interest of the integrity of education in higher education, as well as K-12, for us to be um, honest about what's going on and what we're doing to, uh, you know, lessen it. Thank you both very much. This has been a very enlightening, sometimes scary conversation, but it's heartening to know that people like yourselves are taking a serious look at what to do. Dr. Karen Sims Gallagher is a professor in the Rossier School of Education at the University of Southern California. And Dr. Mark Biggin is a staff scientist in molecular biology at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He teaches at UC Berkeley as well. Thank you for a thoughtful and provocative discussion. I'm Katherine Barron. You've been listening to The Score. The Score is produced by the Academic Integrity and Research Group at Pando Public Relations. It is underwritten by Measure Learning and technical support is provided by This Is Distorted. To ask questions, to download show notes, or to learn more about The Score, visit our website at podcastthescore.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at, at podcastthescore or find us on all the podcasts